because they put the high top up. Also, women, I found that women, serious women walkers, the first thing that will go out on a woman is very serious about walking. The first place that she'll feel the pain. And then the first place I feel pain when I do heavy walking are my ankles. And women are especially prone to this, and a lot of men are prone to this. I'm prone to this because I play hockey in my youth and I ruin my ankles. So, to me, this shoe, when I put it on around the ankle, it's supportive. There's no slippage. This stuff, this is a look. This is one thing where we get fashion. And I can tell you that I travel the world a lot. I see a lot of what's happening. We come out of countries like Scandinavia, Italy, Germany, France. You see all the young women wearing the Mephisto shoes of this elk. Short pants with the thick socks all balled up. It's a very hot look. That's a cool look. It's a very cool look. <laughs> you can go to San Francisco right here. You can such a safe <laughs> Short shorts, socks, a high top shoe. That is real <laughs> shoe. <laughs> we'll do that one time. We always pay after dinner to the dress code. <laughs> well, the point, the point is for women to be reluctant to buy this shoe. Here's the look. You're going to see that look in San Francisco. What do we see? They're going to have those, I think, uh, maybe in December or November. It's probably in the stores uh, right before Christmas. Black, black and green. Black. No, a little higher. When I think the women's here is uh, 2 uh, 10, I believe the men's is at 2. For my personal experience, what I know is anyone who complains of foot slippage at all, you know, a high top shoe, right away you get a lot more security on the foot. You know that. This is all latex and size. You can put a hand in there. So Pass that around. I tell you, you know, it's, it's really rare that a product is hit like these in the fist service. And I've just been a little bit disappointed that we haven't gotten to sell through in the retail level that we've had in, in the mail order. That's why. Yeah, in fact, I, said, I mean, some stores, just like Bob said, some stores have gone through and never appear very quickly. You know, like <coughs> born a weekend for a quiet store at two hundred dollars each is four old men. So tell us one more time, why do you think we're not selling as well, and, and the key points to summarize are the key why I think you're not selling them again. Again, we are selling. You are selling them, but you're not selling them to the point that you're happy with. Right. It's not because we don't have the talent. It's not because we don't have the leadership. It's not because we don't have the locations or the visibility. We have all that. You already own all the hard things. You've got the talent here. Your leadership is here. You sure have the best locations of the country. You have the visibility. But what you don't have is the secureness and the confidence to go out and sell these shoes. What you're lacking is confidence. It's the only thing that you're lacking. What we hope to do with the tapes, my reason for being here, is to give you this confidence that you'll need to sell this product. You can't go out with this product and hem and off. You're going to lose the sale. You're going to hem and there. You're going to lose it to a shoe store. And they're going to find it. They'll find the shoe store. I don't care if they're going to drive 150 miles. Now that they know the brand, they'll find it. You have to convince them that you're as good as any shoe store is going to fit them, and that you know what you're doing, and you're going to do that by showing confidence, by being proud of the product, by having worn the product, hopefully, so you can know what you're talking about. And that's how you're going to sell the shoes. Any of you that have worn the shoes, love the shoes. I've had very few, I've had no people come up to me and say, Bob, I got the shoes, I hate them. I've never had that happen to me. So if you've got the shoes, you like them, tell your customers about it. I said, geez, you know, I put these shoes on, I went shopping, I went this, I walked the dogs, I felt great. This is what your customer wants to hear. Talk to them like your people, which they are. We all have feet, we have the same thing in common. Talk to them about your experience, their experiences with the shoes. Sell the shoes with a lot of confidence, a lot of promise. Again, we sell things the best I think. The more promises, the easier we sell things. And to me, all sales are around the promise. The promise from the feast though, Again, here's your high points. Comfort, all natural materials, soul, renewable resources it's made from, made by hand, made in France, not available everywhere, very limited distribution. In the long run, you're going to love these shoes and you're going to come back to me and buy a second pair. This is what I would tell my customers with a smile. There's very few things you can take up to the register knowing your heart, this is a real cocky thing to just say, but I've always felt this way. Whenever I've seen a person buy a Mephisto, I've always said, so 
myself in exchange for the government to pay them. I've taken $200 from them. But in my mind, I really believe I've done that customer a favor. And if you can see my mail and my phone calls that come into my office about how positive people are on these shoes, you'll find out why I think we're doing these people a favor. Because they're buying the shoes, they're happy with them, they're telling their the friends about them. This company grew from zero to a $10 million company in four years by word of mouth. I didn't do national advertising. I've never done national advertising. It's always been by word of mouth. Richard stopped into a store on Newton Street. The salesman sold him shoes. Sold him. He didn't walk in and say, he had to be sold. He wore the shoes, then he called me, introduced himself to me. He said, do you think this might work in the catalog? I said, I don't know, let's talk about it. Here we are. But the reason he was sold the shoes by a very good store. He knows how to sell shoes. You people can learn how to sell shoes. It doesn't take a rocket scientist. It takes conviction, and it takes knowledge, like anything else. And a good salesperson has a lot of confidence. Without confidence, we're not salespeople. Clerks. So let's believe in what we sell. We go out there and know we have the best, and sell it like it is the best, and we'll be successful like it. So Mephisto plus health plus you equals success. That's true. So let's think about that. Mephisto and health and sharp image equals success. That's your formula. Now you have to take it a moment. You've got a very hot item in the American market right now. You've got a recognition brand that anybody that's traveled to Europe is aware of it. Their friends have heard about it. The feast of wood is getting out. Now's the time to strike. We've got the best of what we make. And I think that we've had some slight delivery problems with you, but by this fall, my homework is done. We'll be over that. And I think we'll go on from here. understood that the moment you saw them. And they just didn't even waver for a moment. It's the most comfortable shoe, the finest shoe. You're going to love this shoe. Our customers come back for extra shoes. They just had all that. So I put them on. I was practically sold just from the enthusiasm of the person. You know, you've all got a day off Wednesday, right? I got a day off Wednesday? Take a walk on Union Square if you have a chance. A business, one of the main shopping streets in the city. Stop into a store called Arthur Barron on Main and Lane in Union Square. Just go in there and listen to the sales people selling the shoes. They sell a lot of our shoes. The store does over two million retail with our shoes in here. It's a lot of shoes. So like you go in there and if you have a chance, just eavesdrop on the sales people. You'll really pick up a lot of stuff. So this is Arthur Barron's and Union Square. It's a very good store. Craig, in a lot of their cities they may have they may have oh, yeah, you will. New York or Chicago. Right. Probably they probably make sure. That's a good idea to go in and in Chicago we had a on. Michigan Avenue, very famous men's stores, Tannins. New York, we're in Tip Top on uh, 72nd Columbus, the very big men's store there. Lace up on the Lower East Side. But again, it's a good idea for you people to go into stores in Schultz. If you're into a local thing, go in there, go in there <coughs> and ask about the Mephisto to see what those sales people have to say. Good. Thank you. Sure. Let's go to the concept store. I think I saw one in Southampton on that. Yeah, East Hampton. Yeah, those are privately owned stores by people that are so sold on the product that they've come to me and they said, Bob, I want to put a store and sell them in budget for me. We're competitive for the pricing. We're competitive. My, my shoes from San Diego to Bangor are one price. Bob out. is the absolute best in the entire country in keeping exact pricing. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, we don't even honor any of our discounts on anything on the piece that were Bose products. If you notice the black yeah, person, the black folks in there. Yeah. Yeah, we're very, we're very yeah. out of it. So, Anytime that you've got anybody that you hear about that's underpricing, I want to know it right away. Because they won't have the shoes for four or five minutes after the call. We're very strict on it. We're very proud of it. We do it by agreements. It's nothing you can do you know, on paper. The best item we've got is the Mephistos. Seriously, in dollars, in the June July period, that was the single best item in the catalog. 
interesting. And yet, it hasn't really gelled at the store level yet. And, and, I, and I say that with two faces because we're selling with these those retail, right? But they're selling. So in fact, probably surprisingly well. But compared to the catalog, the ratio tells me we can sell anywhere between three times as many and four times as many as we're, really, as we're selling right now retail. Because we don't yet understand how to sell shoes, and there's no reason we should yet. I mean, geez, when you said it, it's like the wizard came in and we didn't really train anybody, and no one knew it was a big hit. I mean, it takes a little while to learn that idea. And after six months, I think we'll really be superb. But the sooner we can get up to speed, the faster we can make our fingers. Yeah. One thing that might help me and perhaps others get some ideas, my gel demonstrator keeps the chairs full of people trying gel on. And so you go and you've got somebody that you're going to talk to about shoes, and we're looking around, and there's no place to touch the person to get it on your feet, and then you're trying to pull the uh, footstool over front, and you've got the yeah. pads there, and hey, operation. Why, why don't you come forward and just sit up here easier? And uh, we got a chair. Edward, something with a chair. So I love some <coughs> ideas. It's a good question. Are we going to have a shoe department? Are we going to sit people down? What are we going to do? Craig? What we just did as an experiment, for example, in Ghirardelli, was we'll move the shoe area away from the cello, and we're most likely going to be going to that. So that would alleviate it. You'll have two or three chairs in the gel area, and you'll have one to three chairs in the shoe area. And that would just alleviate that problem. Because you have a, a, what we tried to do was to incorporate both of them. And I, I'm not sure that that was the right incorporation. I think it was initially. But we're just we're adding. Is there an extra chair right now? There is an extra chair right now. Yes. Do we have a little shoe bench yes. in the stores? We're using the uh, gray chair. Well, you're using the gray, but we've got right now you've got three to four gel chairs. We can take one of those chairs off into the shoe bag. That's what we do. I mean, it certainly is true. There's no reason why we should not let people who want to buy a $200 shoe sit down and try it is off. That, is that a problem in a lot of stores? Yeah. 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 How many people think it's a problem? Well, it wouldn't disappoint me if we actually ended up with more of a shoe apartment area has its own designated two or three years. <coughs> how we get room for it, how we make it work, I'm not quite sure, but gosh, we got the moccasins, the pistos, uh, the massage sandals. But while we're talking on the subject, we're going to introduce this shoe in February. This is called Teva. Teva's a fantastic story. I want to just share it with you today so you can, you know, again, this is four months off, so I don't want to tell you too much to confuse us, but just, you're here, let me share with you real quickly. About 15 years ago, a guy was doing guided trips down the Grand Canyon, Colorado River. And he's, his tennis shoes are getting wet all the time. So he invents a new concept, the action sandal, which is a rubber and nylon open shoe that you can walk in, hike in, climb in, bicycle in, walk in, and yet it dries instantly. You wear the ocean, it's impervious to everything. And after 10 years, it finally becomes fairly established called Teva, T-E-V-A. And this year, the concept explodes. And you go to the Action Sports Show in San Diego a month ago, and you see 20 firms copy this shoe. All of them are copying pretty much what Teva did a few years ago, not what Teva's doing this year. And Teva is as excited about having the sharper image introduce their newest shoe as Mephisto is. Because for Teva, this is a sort of a step up to get out of the track and trails and get into the sharp room. <coughs> so we're going to introduce this new model. I think it's called the Contour. That's correct. Yeah. It's called the Contour, which uh, is, is specially <coughs> noted because it's got a, a three-color composite sole. And even though it's got Velcro in three places, you just actually uh, put it on by undoing one Velcro. In other words, you adjust your heel properly. You adjust your front of your foot properly. And then you get in and out of it by just loosening one strap. So I will predict at $59.95, this is going to be an enormous shoe for us. And we're making a big commitment of quantity of dollars. This, this is what people buy who want something that's more active than a Birkin stock. They want to be able to bike in it, walk in it, boat in it, wear it all summer long, wear it with shorts, wear it with blue jeans. And the look is a little strange, but it really is caught on now. Yeah. So we'll pass around, let's look at it. In this particular fabric, which is made in France, even though the shoe is made in the USA, is our exclusive design. This uh, purple and green, it's really good looking. Yeah, it's a lot of fun to wear. Yeah. 
these are 5995. That'll be the February featured items. And, and so again, my point is, we're gonna have a real shoot party. We got the you know, Fistos and about 20 different styles eventually. And then we got the Tevas and we got the um, Open with Fisto. We got the moccasins. And we're probably gonna add another moccasin to complement the rubber W one. We're working on it, but we'll probably add a second moccasin. And we got the massage, massage sandals and who knows what else. So it does bring up this issue really to the, you know, to the decision should we have a formal sit down shoe park. Maybe even with a shoe salesperson, it's really a shoe salesperson. Like we have a gel intersole person right now. We just have one person with dedicated shoe. Yeah. 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 I think so. I think if somebody's in the habit of selling shoes all day, I think they get into that mentality. They're used to lacing them, they're used to sitting down and doing that. Yeah. I mean, personally, I'd like to see that happen in any store that could justify it. He's having a uh, gel person who's constantly asked questions about all the shoes around there. <coughs> I think, I think too, that you're going to see the you know, retail sales and retailers go up because we just got this tape last week. And I know it didn't tell yeah. We watched it Friday, uh, Thursday, and Friday, the store before I got And I, I learned so much more about the shoes, you know, questions I really couldn't answer before. I think this week you'll see the sales increase. I think next week you'll see a more bigger sales. Any other comments? The tape was very good. The tape was very good. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. It talks about the laces lying flat and turning the shoe the right way. Thanks, Cooper. <laughs> Bob is one of the best vendors we've ever worked with in our history. And I, I want to point out, he is very strict in his pricing and how dealers handle his shoes. And he generally will not sell to anybody that, that screws up the Mephisto reputation of where they're pricing. And he won't sell to the department stores. But he has got a very clear vision of what he wants to do. So that's also a caution to us that we should be very careful that we honor his request, that we not discount them, that we not honor any uh, promotion we're doing. Like there's a promotion with American Express coming out where we're gonna give people 15% off if they bring in the coupon. But again, it says the fine print does not apply to this door post. Richard, one uh, possible dilemma with that is when we get a return that has been slightly warned that we can't sell it. Yeah. And does he have a problem with us? Question is, and I wanted to ask Bob that when he was here today, what do we do when the customer comes back asking for a refund? Warm, and it's warm slightly. You know, Craig, you know, he, has, he has no problem with the selling them as demos uh, or uh, up to goodwill of uh, selling them as demos. So we can sell them as a, as a off price. Off, 20% off, yes. Splurge. Any other questions? I, I've worn all, all issues. Well, that how do you, do you find a 9 to 5 that's separately to the other? Well, I'm wearing, so forgive me for taking off my poor worn size 13 here. I, I've worn these to death. I wear these a lot. And what I find the difference is, is just simply, it's a little bit lighter shoe. There's not quite as much to it. And I wear it all the time as a dress shoe. And I, I used to joke that it looks like it came from J.C. Penny. <laughs> and I used to make that joke a lot. After I wore them about a month, I quit making the joke. And you know why? It's obviously because I've come to respect the shoe so much. I don't even think the comparison is worth making anymore. It is such a fun shoe to wear every day because you enjoy standing up. Oh, it's got all this, you know, one thing nice about their sandal and their shoe is they have in three languages some kind of message. The sandal says that, see, this one says uh, airflow and air cushion sole. Airflow and air cushion. Because it actually has little holes in the sole to let the air go through. And the sandal, if you turn it over, unlike the Birkenstock, it looks like it's cut out of a tire tread, you know, randomly. The Mephisto sh shoe sole where their open sandal is actually made for the shoe, and it has the three language description at the bottom that says something like uh, comfort and, and reflex massage technology or something in three languages. It's really spin. Well, when you say waterproof, uh, I would suggest because they're leather, they're gonna you know, soak through eventually, but all of them just so shoes because they have rubber soles, you know, including the one I'm wearing. It's nice because you wear it on a rainy day and if the rubber sole gets wet, there's nothing to curl up or peel or crack. Do you use a shoe tray in your nine to five? I do. And one thing we haven't got into yet is the Fisto brand shoe tree, which Craig and I talked about. And, and I haven't really gotten too far with Bob, but I think we should seriously consider adding that. Because it's not cheap, it's like $29, and I'm sure everybody would buy one pair of a Fisto shoe trees. Because regular shoe trees are a little too pointed. You can use them, I do, but they're a little too pointed for the Fisto. Yeah. So we might make a note of that, Peter, just you know, start testing in one store and shoe trees. It would help to get us we're really stuck on the shoe stoves. We don't be worth it in trees, but 30 buck out on sale, why not? 
Yeah. Well, while Bose and Mephisto are both, you know, price protected for us, would Mephisto run a promotion type like Bose does with the hundred dollar trade in? Maybe not something that extensive, but you know, no the it. best shoe in the world. You know, Bob has <coughs> a very clear attitude that price promotion doesn't make his shoes sell better. And I have to say, I, I tell you, we gave this thing a spread in our June catalog. And do you think I really expected it to sell that well? Honestly, I didn't. I did it because I thought it was a great image piece. It was practical and natural and environmentally correct. But I didn't expect it to sell that well. And it's all like gangbusters. And I'm doing these interviews with reporters, and I'm telling them, gee, we're selling these nice, great $19 and $20 items for the recession. And yeah, our business is up in terms of body count and transactions. And then I point out to them that people are still buying expensive things. The perfect example is they'll buy a $200 running, uh, walking shoe. And why do they buy a $200 walking shoe? Exactly for what he said. People want to buy something that's quality and it will last in a recession. Isn't that right? So I don't think price has anything to do with it. That's why I'm not worried to sell a sandal for 9 to 10. I don't think it has anything to do with it. People just enjoy having something really good that works. Same goes to sales model leather jackets. All pretty close to be real successful because it's the best lambskin, Jeff Hamilton designs, I and mean, it's the leather jacket to own. By the way, before we forget, let's talk about our $250 jacket. Uh, the baseball and basketball is in all the stores. There's a football and maybe a few stores, but mostly because baseball and basketball. There's one real neat hook about that product I want to learn. I hope it goes to a few stores at hand. Who knows what it is? Thank you, guess. Not just is it a knockoff, better than a knockoff. This is the only authorized, licensed Michael Hoban design jacket. And if you, you have to write this down, it's right in the label. It says Michael Hoban. There's a signature. Why is that signature there? This is the only one in the world that is the licensed Michael Hoban jacket. And who is Michael Hoban? He's the designer for North Beach Leathers. So that same jacket is in North Beach Leathers for $1,000. Done in landscape. And we're carrying it in, and maybe it doesn't sound so glamorous, but it's a very durable light material pig leather. <laughs> and pig makes a beautiful leather. It's not as expensive as lamb, but as you noticed, it looks good, it's light, it feels good. And so there's one company called Excel, which the label is also there. It actually says, Where Am I? So I don't know, we went into Where Am I or Excel, which is the parent company. But that company licensed the rights. Three months after every design comes out of North Beach, they can make the exact same Michael Hoban design in pig leather. So there is now, uh, this jacket is in, in North Beach leather for $1,000, and we see it in the Sharp Beach stores. And then there, there are some other designs coming out in three or four months we may test and carry. And, and so very simply, great looking jacket, isn't it? This is the authorized Michael Hoban design jacket that you may have seen in North Beach leathers for $1,000. Yes. Is there a reason we're not doing football jackets in all the stores? Football season? Instead of baseball. Around. Who's had the football version of the stores? Tell us how it's sold. Well, uh, I've only seen it in one of our stores, and that's in uh, uh, Sherman Oaks. And uh, I think it looks great. It's, it's bright colors. It's and purple and yellow. And it's mm -hmm. actually a more of a bluish. Yeah. Did yellow. it sell yet? Uh, you have to ask Dan. Nothing yet. It's only been there about seven days. Has it, have the other ones sold? <coughs> you know, I haven't moved any of them yet, Richard. Yeah, they don't sell football, uh, baseball. Baseball, baseball. Anybody else have the football? You sell one or two football. Baseball sells better. Any other buddy? Anybody else have football? Peter? Peter? I'm sorry, which one? Dan. Dan, that's right. I sold basketball and uh, uh, both jackets, and I get a lot of requests for the football. Yeah. Well, my gut reaction when I saw them is that if you're going to buy football, you might want to buy your team. Your basketball or baseball isn't so much true. And I, I'm a little nervous about it because we're buying into these pretty heavily. And it's a lot of sizes and colors and <coughs> jackets and three sizes. I'm a little nervous. I'm assuming the difference is really, I mean, if you're going to buy a jacket that has football on it or baseball or basketball, we're going to buy the team. Yeah. Yeah. It's a football jacket. It's a generic. This brings up the subject. You left before we were for lunch, talking about common sense. And uh, I was in a store the other day where the, the person walked up, they were touching the jacket, they sort of wanted to try on the baseball jacket, 
the salesman was not really leaping to get it on the back. And I think part of the reason was it was hanging up about six feet high, reversed on a hook, and the rest of them were cable. And I realized that you know if every single thing we sell is cable, they're up six feet tall, we're not going to sell many jackets. Is this true? And yet at the same time, we can't have them just you know flying out of the store being shoplifted. But we have got to reconcile the issue of good design with common sense and security. And what I want to do today is just plant the seed, which I don't think we're going to reconcile, you know, resolve the issue today. I really don't. But I think I can get the discussion started. And I think Craig will be thinking about it. we will be thinking about it. And that is, it's sort of what I see every time I visit a store is that there's a struggle between what I've been told to do and what makes good sense. At least you're sort of smiling. What are you thinking? Well, that, that affects anything happens where you read, well, first of all, the amount of cables. But I had wanted the football jacket, I mean, the, the baseball, Speak up, baseball and basketball jackets out where people could touch them and put them on. And I thought that would be really exciting for them to just get it on and see what's up in the air and hopefully not run out the door with them. So we put them pretty well near the cash wrap. Well, then. They ran. No, they didn't oh. run. <laughs> 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 so we did, you know, and it's very practical for our store because we do have a high theft thing, so we're really struggling between practicality and what's going to sell the jacket. Okay, so I've got to be careful. I don't want to do anything to undercut Joe Williams, who, who's one of the people I respect most in our entire company. I mean, I've worked with Joe probably six years, and I think he's absolutely the greatest. Susan's been with us 10 years, right? And I respect Susan tremendously. And yet, um, if I walk in a store, and I did the other day, and there's an island in the middle of the store where the cash wrap is, and the register is at that island. And the island happens to be one of our older stores. It's a big, it's a big island. And so it's about six feet from the jewelry counter to the island that's behind. Does that make sense? It's a circular thing. It's the older stores design. There's a circular jewelry case and counter, and there's a register, and there's an island in the middle of this whole thing about this big. We put a product on it. So they've got a product that's the jewelry cleaner. And they've got the cover on the jewelry cleaner. They're sitting back there about six feet away from the jewelry. So if you, you know, stand there and you just look at the jewelry, and you go about as far as I am <coughs> from me to Vinny, or maybe this far. And there's this jewelry cleaner over there with the top on. It's like there's a little sign next to it. It's like maybe if I borrow the uh, Jason telescope, I can put it inside. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what common sense is there in this? And yet somebody had been told in their mind take that product and put it there. And yet, honestly, I think everybody that works at that store could have agreed it didn't make any sense to have the jewelry cleaner there. Nobody knew what the heck it was. And it certainly didn't make any sense to have the sign there. It didn't make any sense. And I asked them, I said, why don't you just put it on top of the jewelry counter? They said, well, I think we've been told never to put anything on top of the jewelry counter. Is that true? I don't know. Maybe it's true. <laughs> I didn't think it was true either. <laughs> the, person, the person was trying their best to follow the rules. You know, they, 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 they can't fault them for that. They're trying their best. And yet it didn't make any common sense. And what I see happening a lot of times is there's an opportunity to make a sale or to do more business. And what you've got to do is motivate your people or motivate the person above you to change it so that it makes sense. Because honestly, I was saying to Craig the other day, I probably would never get mad or upset with anybody if they said to me, this isn't the rules, but I found when I did this, we sell them twice as fast. You think I'm going to get upset about that? I doubt it. And yet, if you said to me, well, I know we don't sell any this way, but this is what somebody told me to do. But you're like going, well, you know, you're trying, but you're not really helping us. Like I saw um, this juice mate, this can, that we left, we were breaking for lunch. Juice makes like this can, like sort of like diet, like ultra slim fast. It's a can. It's got a real nice label. And they took this thing, they put it in the middle of the glass case, they put all these products around it. And I said, well, why is it in there? And they said, well, this is the test store. I was told that any test product should be under glass. I go, okay, well, you know, they're trying their best. It's a good rule. Okay, I guess they thought that was the rule. Maybe it wasn't. I don't know. But the point is, it's stupid. You know, and all of a sudden, that is stupid. You can't sell $14.95 powder that goes in, a, in an orange juice glass under glass. It's like, come on. So we took the product out. We took two more of them. We stacked a little pyramid on the slat wall like we do the vitamins. Boy, the thing looked great because it's a bright yellow and black label. 
with three of them standing there on the wall, it's really tough. And now, better yet, you can pick up the can and read it. It says, it says what it is. You can mix this in your juice, it's vitamins in powdered form with some fiber. Hey, not bad. Maybe I'll buy a can. So I never figured out what it was like under glass. And it's one of the things you're going to hear this week, and the parents ought to work with me on this. We want to get these inexpensive products out of the glass. You know, the idea that we have in our mind somehow is that every product is some little precious thing. We want to either protect it from the customer or lock it away from the customer or keep the customer from getting their hands on it. That isn't how we started. And you know that and I know that. And yet I was in the store and they got one loose side sailboat, I think, in the whole store. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe they did too. And this loose side sailboat was under the glass. And it's like, come on, it's a 14, you know, what is it, 1995? Get the darn thing out, let somebody. And this happened to be a store that has about four jewelry cases. I mean, they got a lot of glass surface here. They could have put one loose side sailboat on the jewelry case. And somebody might have walked over, picked it up, and played with it. Just common sense. So I can't answer this question today, and you can't satisfy yourself if you're going to do exactly the right thing. But again, I got to tell you, if it helps us sell something, I promise you nobody's going to be upset with you. And if it keeps us from selling something, probably there's reason to suggest you weren't using the common sense that I'm encouraging you to use. Let me give you another example. It turns out this sample, may, this example, may be a flawed example. Because it turns out the facts may not be as I'm telling them to you. But nevertheless, the salesperson told me what they told me. You know, the SIP jackets have really been selling. We had trouble getting them stuck. The black and the mocha plain baseball jacket. So I go in the store, and they got three of the black baseball jackets hanging on the rack. No mocha. I said, did you get any mocha? The salesman goes, yeah, we only have two. I go, well, where are they? He says, I took them off the floor. Why'd you take them off the floor? We only had two. Well, gee, if you leave them out of the floor, maybe you'll have zero. <laughs> he says, well, I didn't think we should put them out if we only had two. I'm thinking to myself, well, gee, you got the black ones hanging here. So hang black, mocha, black, mocha, black. So he did that. It looked fine. I mean, what's wrong with that? Nothing. But honestly, if it turns out there's some disagreement now, maybe they were defective, and maybe that's why they're off the floor. The salesperson honestly thought a good answer was, we took them off the floor because we only had two left. And I thought, what a dumb answer. And that's where I'm encouraging you to just to put your thinking cap on and say, what, what around here is going to make some money for this company? And hang them in the back, I guarantee you it won't make any money. And I have actually been to stores, and you probably have experienced this yourself, where some of your one-of-a-kinds are, I've seen it with jewelry a lot, and the jewelry will be in the vault, and there won't be a single example of that piece out, because Oh, yeah, I just haven't thought about it lately. I mean, common sense, obviously, it's never going to sell in the back, but I've seen this before. Honestly, I have, but it's not just once. I was in a store the other day where they had a very inaccessible corner, and they just got in their quilted jackets, and they took that quilted jacket and they hung it in the most inaccessible corner. The customer would never walk over there. And in the tea stand, it was in the most conspicuous spot, they had the hooded jacket, and not the hooded, the uh, pocket jacket. Robert Stock, the multi-sport jacket. When I asked him why, they sort of thought, well, we thought over there in that inaccessible corner, people might see it when they're walking through the mall, which wasn't a bad bit of logic, even though the fact is it's black. And the fact is when you walk through the mall, the black thing in the corner pocket of the store doesn't really show up. And the fact is when you walk in the store, the first thing you bump into is the tea stand. And the fact is the item that every store would like to have is silk jackets, so put it on the darn tea stand. And I said to him, I said, does this bag jacket sell? He goes, no, no not really. And I said, well, why is it on this rack right here? And he goes, well, I, I, uh, it's a good spot for it, or I was told to put it here, or whatever he said. And the point was just simply, I think to myself, common sense. You know, let's take a hot item and put it in a hot spot in the store. Because the fact is, you want your register to ring every day, and if you've got an item that's going to sell, and if you put it in the best spot in the store, it'll sell. The thermoscan is another good example. Right now, we have one thermoscan thermometer in the whole store, probably sitting in one of those glassed-in ML stores, <laughs> sitting there by itself. Well, that's not bad, as long as we can't keep them in stock. But I tell you, other than the Mephistos and the <coughs> jacket, that's probably the single hottest product in our company right now. So as soon as we get enough of those in stock, I would make it perfectly obvious how to find that product when you walk into the store. 
whether that means you know, doing a race with boxes or whether it means missioning everybody who walks in or carrying your pocket. I don't care what we do, but the fact is that is a hot item. And everybody wants one or they've heard about it. And having one hidden someplace in the glass case, buried, not hidden, it's not hidden, it's just buried. It's a hard way to sell it. But it doesn't matter, right, because we can just thought everyone we could get. But that will change very shortly. I guess that also brings up the thought, you know, here's another bit of common sense. You just give me examples. If you've got two products that are selling well, maybe the Lucite sailboat and maybe, uh, pick another one. The, little, the LCD digital clock. And you've got a lot of one and practically none of the other, let's say, one week. And still what you end up with is one of each out of the stores. You've got this 2,000 square foot store, one of each, even though you happen to have a hundred of one in stock and about zero of the other in stock. If it was my store, I'd probably put two out of the one that's really hot. Why not? If you've got a lot of something, you're going to get some attention if you put it out, where if you just have one of every single thing, the fact is they may walk through the whole store and miss it. Mark. Oh, a clear example of that, Richard, is our clothing. One product of the last couple of years we have put out in bulk and it is sold very, very well. The Tyvek jacket, putting one out, the water falls down and makes a great presentation. We have blown them out. Mm -hmm. the same thing with the soap stuff. So mm -hmm. it does address the situation with product. It'll work the same way. And I know we have planograms, I know we have rules, and I want us to follow them. But I don't want you to feel that that rule has to keep you from making a sale. And again, all I can promise you is. You wait until the situation comes up where something is selling and you've done <coughs> something which is slightly different than what you were told, and I promise you no one's going to get real upset with you because it sold well. I mean, yeah, if you stack up thermoscans in a mound six feet tall and four feet wide and move the I don't think we'll like that. <laughs> and if they're getting shoplifted so fast that it doesn't work, I think we'll be very happy about that. Or if you uncable something, all the jackets disappear. But on the other hand, if you've got a high quality clientele and you're told to cable something and you uncable it and finally one gets shoplifted, but you've been selling them like crazy, unless it's the Jeff Hamilton jacket, <laughs> I don't think we're going to get upset with you. I just want to set a mood. And again, it's got to all be sorted out between Craig, Susan, Joe, you, me. But we've got to get some common sense into how we interpret the rules. The most common one, and it's just my little pet peeve, is I go in the store, there's a product and the signs underneath it. The real common example is you put the product like two feet off the ground, then you put the sign underneath it because you were told to put it right underneath, right? And only a person who's two feet tall <laughs> can put the sign. But hey, I was told to put the sign right underneath the product, right? That's the rules. I don't know, Craig, you have something to do this. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, you, you said it very well. <laughs> Accessible right there instead of having to run upstairs around the corner or wherever, wherever we got in the store. 
So there's a solution to every store. If it's Dallas, I wouldn't put a cable in it. <coughs> Period. Send the cables to Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if it's Madison Avenue, I just go like that. <laughs> 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 uh, right, with the shields on. <laughs> but, yeah, it's, and, but each store, it's just like we were, you know, we had a pretty heated, um, upright discussion about the dress code. Every store has its nuances. Uh, but let's use common sense in addressing every store. And there's always a solution to the situation. And, and frankly, I wouldn't enable a silk jacket anywhere. So if you're doing that, we should just undo it. I would definitely cable the leathers where you think it's appropriate. And Jeff Hamilton will, will be what we talk about vertical merchandising. And it's got to be vertical enough so that you know, a six foot kid can't jump up. And yeah, so, so much for common sense in first place. <coughs> I, I don't know if this is going to address one of your questions, but did discuss it. You know, you're talking about getting products out on the slap wall, getting them out. And I agree with you 100%. And we've got a lot of colorful products that are coming into our stores that we need to get out on the floor. We've also got the problems with these posters, which do add a lot to the products. They, are, they do take up not a lot of space on the slat wall that is now making it complicated for the store managers to get this merchandise out. User-friendly fashion. <coughs> sure. I think what, what we need to do is, uh, first of all, we'll be sending out the planogram, the, the posters that we'd like to see up. And based on kind of this new improvement in direction to get more things out of the walls. I think we're going to have to give you a list on that. that let's say there's 10 posters we want to use. There might be five of those 10 that we're going to give you as optional. Because yeah. right now, I mean, the two of the biggies are the Sound Soother and the uh, Tooth where we have those on separate three-foot walls. We're going to put a lot more product on there, and we'll just need to make a decision on how they can Well, if, if our sales were so high that we were jumping off the charts, everybody was 20% above the Yurga levels, and we came to the store and they hit the posters up, and I asked you why not, and you said because I thought I could sell a lot more product if I put this product up there, I may say, well, we'd like to have the poster up. But this year, I think I'd rather have the product up there and have you tell me I thought I could sell a lot more product if I had this product up there. So we'll give you a list. Yeah, we'll give you a No one's going to fault you for doing something to make some sales. Let's take a break and uh, let's keep it you know, brief and we come back in 10 minutes. <laughs> Shaver, 
from 169 also excludes the sharper image. And we have the woman's shape that we did sell in cobalt blue. We've got the new gold P touch on uh, page 47 also. The gold P touch, you receive a carrying case, three 25 foot label cartridges, the AC adapter. So, what makes it gold edition? Here, help me. What makes it gold edition is uh, primarily that you get all of the extra pieces, right? Uh, with it, you don't have to go out and buy the uh, extra um, label uh, uh, inserts or any of that stuff. And if you add up all those, all of the costs that you'd have to, if you went out and bought a regular P-Touch plus, plus the label uh, things, it actually costs you more than just buying the gold one. So if they ask, why is this a different price? The answer is, the gold edition is Brothers' newest. And it's a more complete kit. You actually get more pieces in the kit. No, it, it, it has a definite value of three cartridges to it. The three cartridges. We sold them two for thirty-five dollars, and that all that came from that cost. That exclusive. Plus, there was no AC adapter. Right. On page thirty-nine, there's a woman's watch. I want to point out here. This came two days ago. The bottom right-hand corner. This is the Lucian Picard woman's watch. It's a great-looking watch. For a hundred dollars, it looks like a fifteen-hundred-dollar watch. There was this woman in the store the other day, and she said, what's the difference between this watch and a $1,500 watch? You want to know the honest and goodness answer? The real answer is, a $1,500 watch, the gold parts would probably be real gold. On this watch, they're gold plated. Is the watch quality equal? Absolutely. Swiss quartz movements are excellent, Japanese quartz movements are excellent, and no one is ever going to find a difference in quartz movements. They're going to find a difference in the quality of, is it solid gold, or is it gold plated over stainless? This is gold plated over stainless, but as you get the Lucian Picard name, you get a great look, it looks expensive for 100 years. It's going to be a real good selling watch, and most of the watches we have bought very heavily into, so you're not going to find yourself running out of stock. What you're going to find is you're going to have great watches this year. Good price point for a lot of uh, Telux, 159. We've got the two Zonix watches, which you've started to see in the case. One is the black Zonix, and one is the gold and champagne Zonix. Uh, and this is on the table this week that you got in front of the Zonix. Very simple. One sentence Zonix is the professional diver's watch, among others. And when you buy a Zonix watch, you're getting a lot of waterproof quality. I think it's like 600 feet of black uh, socks and the metal socks. And you buy the Lucian Picard, you get into a great name. We have three of them. The man's leather strap, the man's metal strap, the woman's metal strap. When you buy the accent on design watches, the Aerox or the Axis for $59.95, you're getting a watch that's 150 feet water resistant. You're getting a Japanese movement. You're getting a really nice to make watch for $59. <coughs> D-Shock for $25, that's a heck of a value for a starter watch or for somebody who wants a weekend watch. These are really nice watches for the money. We'll be getting into some others later on also. Let's go to page uh, 29 to talk about the uh, artifacts. This is the new small artifact, $99.95. Same idea, <coughs> but just reduced them to a small size. So you can find a place to hang it. Those big ones were hard to hang. They have a big place for what to spend $800. Now, for $99.95, you can enjoy that really advanced computer technology. This is a hard product to explain though, in a sense. Who wants to take a stab at it? I've been practicing on the other autographs, so. Somebody walks in the store and they're staring at this <coughs> picture. They'll have some of these in your store. Stuart, do you want to take a stand on it? Authentic reproduction. That's my later. Tom. Your 
groups at a great price. That's good. Reproduction of the great masters, <laughs> then by the most advanced computer technology in the world. They actually reproduce not only the design, but even the texture. It's an amazing technology. They're really nice for $99 already. It's a real nice product. Page previous, 26 and 27. <laughs> <laughs> we had a good, we had a good uh, success with it last year. You've got those back in your stores already. Who wants to try that? Who wants to, somebody's looking at these ski gloves. What's so great about these gloves? Never get cold hands. Never get cold hands. Great. I like that. Okay. Do it another way. Waterproof, waterproof, leather gloves. Great. How about tie back? You know, I gotta apologize. And this is a funny <coughs> apology, but uh, you know what's happened with this uh, balloon jacket? We got this balloon jacket in. The darn thing was panned by probably everyone in our company. I don't think there's a person in the room that liked that jacket we heard that. And yet the darn thing sold like crazy. So I thought, this is easy. We just order about a zillion on the next one. And it'll sell like crazy too. So I get in this football jacket, and quite frankly, it hasn't sold nearly as well as the balloon jacket. And I apologize for that. Are we going to mark it down to 29? Sorry, down to yeah. And I hope we'll move through them and get out of them. Then we have a ski jacket coming up in the holiday book. And I don't, I don't want to prejudice that honestly, I don't think it's as good as the balloon jacket either. We didn't buy them about a third as many as the football jacket, thank goodness. And I hope we sell through them quickly because I think I figured out, as you probably figured out, what makes the jacket sell or not sell. It probably wouldn't hurt me though to hear it again. Tell me why the balloon sell and the football didn't sell. It was simple to understand. Yeah. We got in a moment. Yeah. yeah. And unfortunately, as you can see, it's the same problem with these somewhat. They're a little busy, a little hard to understand. So the picture looks like it's one jacket on both of it. Well, at any rate, by by that, by that February, I bet you, I expect <coughs> we're going to be back on track and get a tie bag jackets that sell fast and that have clear, easy to understand patterns in clear colors. And uh, I want to just do the best we can to get through these football and the ski jackets. But let's talk about tie bag. What is tie bag? Wayne, you want to try it? Somebody walks up there feeling this and go, hey, is this paper? No, this is a great product that's uh, warmer than nylon, stronger than cotton, and only weighs five ounces. Product made by DuPont Company. Thing that's used to wrap houses with now. You wrap it, it makes the house waterproof for you exterior side in it. Yeah, it's interesting. Tyvek was developed by DuPont originally for houses. It is so tough and durable, and it does breathe, but it will stop moisture. It's a, it's a great miracle fabric that makes a perfect jacket for one simple reason. What's the reason? Lightweight. Lightweight. Contact, you can fold it up, put it in your pocket, take it out, put it on, you've got a windbreaker. It's a really good uh, casual jacket to take with you. We already know that. I think we've learned $39.95 is the right price. We'll probably stay at $39.95. And we'll introduce some good, clear, easy to understand patterns to sell. Can we get those in solid? I've got a lot of golf that's more than solid colors. Is that right? What about us? Follow up with the logo, the Shark Drinkers logo. Who's right there? <laughs> you know, what I experience with the Sharpridge logo is it does better as a label than it does as a badge. Yeah. Yeah. Unless it's really <coughs> subtle like on the running suit. But maybe you're right, maybe it's just solid and tight. Hey, I think what people like in these is you can't print them in the bright colors. they will just come up with some simple, easy to understand patterns. Yeah. I've had a lot of people request papers today because they think, yeah, they feel that it's a, you know, it's a nice compact suit. They want something just like that to go walking with the They ask for that pants. Yeah. They're available. It'd be interesting to see how the running suit Turn back one more page, page 25. You can see the upper left hand corner, what we call the stress shields. The one thing I've learned about stress shields so far in your store is probably you have to open them so they look like goggles and put them on a little build-up suit or something. They come with a stand that hangs 
And you see that stand on the little picture here. But if you display them that way in your stores, they will never sell because no one knows what they are. You can't figure it out from looking at that object on the stand. You go, what the heck is that? So what you got to do is you got to take them off the stand, hide the stand, unfold the things, put them on a little buildup or something. Susan will help you. Or just put them on a little great buildup so they look like goggles. So then you got this book here. This is Life, Medicine of the Future, that comes with a product. So I'm in the store. They got this product on a little stand. They got the book open to a page of text in the book. Some black and white text. This word is on the page. And you go, the common sense light goes off in my head. I'm going, why is this book open to this page? And what does it mean to anybody? I mean, what are we selling here? An open book? There's no diagram. There's just words on this page. And it, you know, it's pretty like any book. The words are pretty small. So I was like, who's reading this book? No one. So why is the book sitting here? No reason. I mean, what should they do? Any suggestions? Close the book. Close the book. Look at the cover of the book. Light, medicine of the future. That I can read. That's going to register as dimly. It's common sense. <coughs> this is a product, I have to tell you, if we had tested the stores ahead of time, we would have probably bought a few less. It's a very difficult product to understand in the stores. Because unlike the, the pulsing red light uh, interquest, it's a very subtle product. You know, you look inside and what you see is either yellow light or green light or red light. Richard, one general comment. They have this product. They seem to be very uncomfortable. Yes. They hurt, they hurt your eye. They're not uncomfortable. I think there's that particular. But I think it depends. I mean, it, it, the cuffs sort of fit over your eyes if you have a lot of eyelashes or the eyes are big. It's true. Well, this is probably one of those products that will not be around next uh, year when we meet. And yet, it is an interesting, well-made product. And quite frankly, I happen to be in the camp. I cannot stand the interquest. I mean, the guy walks into me the other day. The store, he goes, what are these things for? He says, you know, I tried these on. They don't make me relax at all. They just make me nervous. And I said, listen, friend, I agree with you 100%. <laughs> That's why we didn't sell them for six months after they were introduced, those interquest goggles. Because that was the most aggravating product. That's why we give people epileptic seizures. <laughs> I can't stand that product. You get it sold like this? You sold it? So this product, for a lot of people, I think will be a much more satisfying experience. You go home, each color does different things. There is a whole science of what red light does. There's evidently a science of what different colors do. And you quietly in a room sit and expose your eyes open to just green light for a while and meditate, and you are very much soothed. And I believe that. I mean, to me, that sounds like an experience I would enjoy. So now having pulsing lights just drives me insane. Which I did it for half an hour before I came to the <laughs> So I guess the point is, this is not going to be an easy product to sell because it is so subtle. But it is a nicely made product. Let the cover of the book show. Make it look like goggles. And we may surprise ourselves that it sells better than we think, especially when the catalog hits, because this is a real nice present. The massage table we've been selling underneath for uh, $1,995. Now we're introducing also a new product called Relaxor. Relaxor is priced at $49.95. This is a new one will be $599. Well, that's it. Thank you, Peter. The one we have testing in the stores right now is $549.95. That's almost identical to the one you see out in the marketplace, except it has a special cover made this for us. The new one we're going to sell is $5.99. And that is similar to a product you have seen in other catalogs and stores in black for $4.99, called Relaxor. It looks a lot like our massage bed, but they're completely different products. Let's try and understand the difference real quickly. The one we sell now, as you know, has the rolling system. And a lot of people like that and want that. And a lot of salespeople have told me there's no comparison of the two. You either want the rolling system for $2,000 or you don't want anything. The other one has some real good uses. It is basically a vibrating system. Like in the old days when you went to a motel and they had magic fingers by the bed and put your quarters. <laughs> this is basically magic fingers in a pan. It just tingles you. And it's really nice. It's got uh, four, five Karen, stages of positions, starting from foot to under leg to buttocks to shoulders to neck. There's five of them. And it goes either in sequence 
or you can just concentrate on one area, and it just gently vibrates you and loosens you up. And the product has a couple real strong selling points. For one thing, you can use it as an extra mattress. It's a perfectly great mattress. Somebody comes over, you want to bed, pull the thing out. There's no, there's no mechanism.